Everything that you know about how you live, work, play will change over the next three years. From how you take care of your health to how you fall in love, it is all going to change very, very quickly. And to explain that, I gotta start the story about 20,000 years ago. If you ever have the philosophical, how did mankind have dominion over the earth, what separates us from the animals, it's one very simple thing. 20,000 years ago, before we had cities, before we had towns, before we were agrarian and figured out crops, we figured out how to store knowledge outside of our bodies. We augmented our reality by showing people how to attack the buffalo, how to hunt, how to do things. And that one instance of being able to pass cumulative information changed us. So as we go on the exponential curve of, of, learn, of, of time, forward another 10,000 years, by then we had all those, those things that look like uh, video game controllers are representations on this oldest sign that we have of buildings in this village, and it's the first warning sign to say, hey, stop, don't go past the village because there's this volcano and stuff will hurl down on you and you will die. So we learned very quickly how to communicate more and more stuff so we didn't have to learn everything ourselves. And that set us on this path where we quickly, another factor of time, 5,000 years ago, we now have a language. We now can write down complex things, keep track. Do we have enough grain to sustain us through, through the summer? In mathematics, all these things grow out of that. And then you go another factor 500 years ago and Gutenberg comes up with this idea of movable type. So you can now mass produce knowledge at a lower cost than hand scribes. But all that knowledge is stored in large libraries that only the rich have access to. And it doesn't help you if you're not there at the time. So we have a disconnect between what society has learned and us. Which comes to the modern sign in Los Angeles, which makes me question, do I have a college education? Do I know how to read? And more importantly, am I going to get a $435 ticket if I park here? And it's funny how I know what that ticket cost, because I did park. Um, <laughs> So let me talk about how our future is going to change. And this is a, a wonderful video, if you haven't seen it, a dystopian look at the future when we have complete augmented reality on everything we do, a hyper-reality, what I call Times Square on acid. And imagine a world where you can never, like when it says mind, you know, look to your right when you're in England on the sidewalk so you don't get hit by the cars that are on the other side of the road. So the road turns red. You know not to go in it. It turns green when you're allowed to go. But every business, everybody will be bombarding us with things and it will be mind blowing. But what's going to happen is we will have trusted filters to this knowledge so that we can make sense of our environment. So what's happened is we're going into this fourth transformation in computing in our lifetime. So the first one was the PC, which allowed us to have an intelligent machine to work with, okay? Then, the internet suddenly connected us to an ever-growing body of knowledge, an endless amount of knowledge that is always accurate and up-to-date and sometimes not factual. Um, but then mobile allowed us to take that with us as we went out and hunted, so to speak. But the last piece was connecting us to our environment, to have the knowledge we need where we are, when we are, and our environment know what knowledge we need. And that's the fourth transformation, what I call environmental singularity, that is fundamentally going to change what we do. That phone will not come out of your pocket. You will always wear glasses. And just give you a sense of how quick this happens, Christmas this season, it's now affordable. Last year, Americans bought 85 million pairs of glasses for more than $100. So the idea of glasses that do more than just focus, suddenly it's only one app away. And uh, next week I have a column in Fortune of what I believe the top 10 apps will be next year in augmented reality. But I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them as we go ahead. So what are the stats that are driving this? Um, this is from Mary Meeker's stuff. You know, we have half the population now on the internet and the rest coming along. Smartphones are ubiquitous. Five years ago, we're on the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. Five years ago, we spent an hour in the US a day on the internet on our mobile phones. Today, it's three hours, okay? So we are getting used to having access and wanting to be always on, always connected, but we're driving the searching, the sorting, the figuring out what do we need to know. It's not there for us. 
And then on the commerce side of business, this year we hit the inflection point where internet advertising exceeds television advertising. Those things that you've been shuttling through for 10 years, uh, they now realize you do it. So where does that take us? That takes us to a $143 billion new market that has no owners. So every 800 pound gorilla that owns some sector, media, telecom, delivery, healthcare, automotive, are all now fighting for this new piece of turf. And we're looking at a world that will have 500 million headsets very, very quickly. And as excited as you should be about virtual reality, and I do a lot with virtual reality with a lot of clients for a lot of spectators, it's the baby sister. Augmented reality is the ubiquitous every day. If 10 years ago I told you you'd be looking at your phone for three hours a day, you would put me in the loony bin. So the sectors, it's not just about hardware. We're not talking about games. We're talking about enterprise solutions for every business. And the rate of disruption, we're in an era of endless di disruption where 100-year-old companies are being replaced by companies that are less than 100 days old. And that acceleration will happen quicker and quicker as we have more equality of access to this. You only need two things to survive in this new future. Insight and persistence. Everything else can be hired and figured out. And insight comes from data. So what's so great about augmented reality when we've actually had it for a long time? Pepper's Ghost, uh, this week is the 48th anniversary of the opening of the Haunted Mansion. So Pepper's Ghost has been around for over 100 years, that effect. The difference was we had augmentation as a theatrical effect, not as a daily part of a life. On television, that first yard line, it's not really on the field. So we've had that for a long time. By the time the next Olympics come to LA, everybody in the stadium will be seeing those lines. We'll also see when somebody gets injured, how that affects your fantasy sports team and those stats live. You'll have your own playback. Everybody will have a customized experience of every form of sports, and we're working on those things right now. So what's different about Pepper's Ghost and augmented reality isn't what the augmentation is. It's all of the technologies that are below the surface that are coming together for the first time to allow us to solve problems that most of us didn't realize were problems because we accepted that's the way it is. If you're walking through the Amazon rainforest and a snake bites you and you want to know whether it's venomous, you know, now your glasses will tell you what that snake is and how long you have. <laughs> so let's go through your typical day that all of you experienced to come to this talk today. First, you can use VR and see every hotel, every resort, every meeting facility before you get there. In the, in the business use case, you know, if you've been trained on one type of uh, Navy destroyer and you're going to be deployed on something else, you can walk the hallways, learn where the equipment, how to do your job, very big. So that takes you one part, that seems accessible, we get that. The minority report type effect where you can point at a building or touch and find out the information that you want. And today you can do the stuff with your phone or with your tablet. You can walk down the street and hold it up and know stuff and you say, well, that seems like copious. Well, 750 million people did it with Pokemon Go. 750 million people, okay? And it was a very simple application. It was the Pong of augmented reality. And what we learned from that interaction is everything that we've learned on a computer in our lives, we learned in a museum, we learned in a book, was within a frame. The frame is now gone. We're now coming to that singularity of us and the environment. So let's take one of those exponential technologies, voice recognition. It is now as accurate as human, and I'm on the wrong side of 50, voice recognition is now more accurate than me in a meeting. So we put those things together, and let me give you my killer app, number one killer app that will change life. Pretend for a second you're back in those single years you're taking your trip across Europe, across the Himalayas, you're, you're going to Cambodia, wherever, and you see the most beautiful person that you'd like to talk with. But they speak French or Swahili or Hebrew or Arabic or whatever it is. You travel with two pairs of glasses. We now have at Deloitte in Denver where we can talk and I'm getting subtitles live of what you're saying to me in English or in any other language. So now any two people can communicate. 
What does that do to how we do business, how we travel, how we break down barriers, how we fall in love? Supermarket and retail. Most people think of augmentation as adding. I come from LA, that's what augmentation is for most actresses. Um, but augmentation, thank you for the pity laugh. Um, augmentation can also be subtracting from the environment. So a typical supermarket has 40,000 SKUs of which the average American household buys 200 products a year. It's a lot of noise and bombardment. Every brand is trying to call out, buy me, buy me, buy me, and they're all next to each other until it's this cacophony of noise. But you just found out you're diabetic. You don't know all the stuff, you can't remember everything. Now you can walk down the aisle and only the foods that you should have will appear. Everything else fades out. Or you're going on the keto diet or you're going to, you're looking for halal food or kosher food or vegan food. The environment now helps you and brands then can give you incentives now that they know what those choices are that you're making. And it goes one step further. Every physical purchase at retail in the brick and mortar will have the same variable pricing as airplane tickets and hotel rooms do today. Two people, same shop, same day, different pricing based on different needs different relationships. You will share your data to have that benefit. When you're at home, catalogs can now show you products in actual detail, actual size. You can try on, this is today, uh, 2017, you can go in front of mirrors at certain retail stores or do it at, at home with your tablet or phone with the next phones that are coming out this, this uh, holiday season where you can try on makeup virtually. You do this, this isn't like Snap where it's kind of cute. This is like, oh my God, I'm wearing that eyeshadow. Uh, you can see those combinations. It can identify your skin. It can tell whether, you know, here you need a lightener uh, because you have an age spot or hey, go see a doctor because that might be melanoma. So amazing new things that we can do. Number one re reason furniture is returned at Ikea, 14%, didn't fit in the space. Spatial recognition, not a good skill that most of us spend a lot of time on. So, you know, most people like, love that Christmas tree. They'll go, oh my God, that's so great. And then you go, oh yeah, I have an eight foot ceiling when you get home. Um, so, solves that. The second thing is it's fundamentally going to change education, corporate training, learning. For most of mankind, because we didn't have access to libraries and equally distributed stuff, many cultures revere and still give trophies to people that can memorize the most. If you could memorize the whole Quran, that's a great feat. Memorization, being an apprentice, learning stuff and storing information that is out of date the second you learn it, is something of the past. Knowing how to access that information and have it for you is all you ever have to learn and it'll be there. So, so you can look at the car. A typical, when I started in business, because I worked on uh, laser discs to repair cars, I'm old, um, but hip. It, the average car came with 40,000 pages of documentation that went to that dealership. For many people that reading English is not the first language, so it was take out good parts and replace with good parts until you find a bad part and replace it and you, the consumer, pay. so who needs efficiency? Now the car can tell you what to do, it can communicate with you, and when you hit that problem that it doesn't know, your glasses have see what I see. Someone that is more experienced can be sitting anywhere in the world and see it and talk to you and walk you through it. Let's take utility poles. We like having electricity. We like living in a first world country. Half of all the linemen in the United States that keep the grid going will retire in the next six to seven years. We will have a tremendous shortage. There's not enough time to apprentice, train, and go through everything that needs to be done. You can't bring a manual up when you're 80 feet in the air and hope to fix one of these things. And by the way, if you hit the wrong wire, there's no reset and play again. You're fried and you die. So, augmented reality, the same thing, it can see that. You get up there and all of a sudden it's a circuit board, a special transformer from 1983, you've never seen one, but Ralph has. Ralph now sees what you're seeing, can walk you through, and the machine learning records that process so the next person that sees that use case now has up-to-date knowledge. And we're working with tons of companies doing really amazing problems. So see what I see, having instructions that are always there, and having your equipment and your environment talk to you. So when you're just walking through a factory, your glasses will show you if a piece of equipment is not, the centrifuge is not spinning at the right speed or has the wrong temperature, or an accident could happen on an oil rig, it will give you advance knowing. Each person on that construction site will know where each other person just as Tesla's know. 
So the world becomes safer, machinery knows what's going on, the big shovel and the big pushy thing and all those things, the technical words, um, will now be safer. It also gives you superhuman power. I can now see through walls and see where electrical conduit is. I can see where the water pipes are. I cannot drill into uh, the pipe in the high-rise condo like my dad did, and his neighbor downstairs was on a six-month vacation. Um, so you can now see plans. Firemen can be in smoke build buildings and see where every wall and every exit and every stairs are. Here's my favorite one. There's a bunch of brave people that climb up those cranes every day all around the world. And then at 10 o'clock, somebody says, I need to move the thing from here to there. And they look at their monitors and they do the little levers. They don't need to sit up there and those cranes fall and they die and they kill other people. They can be sitting in a nice air conditioned office somewhere and they can be doing the crane in Dubai, Denver, Botswana, anywhere. So we're getting greater efficiency, greater communication. In food service, the example of taking stuff away, as you raise minimum wage, there is pressure to reduce jobs. Having people shadow other employees to learn stuff, now you can sit with VR, learn and practice the muscle memory of putting together the new sandwich, and when you're on the line, you can see what to do. But here's the best part. Somebody orders the cheeseburger with no cheese. When you go to grab for the cheese, the bin is empty. It's not really empty, but you're seeing it as empty. Remember, these glasses are tracking where your eyes and your eye angle, and you cannot differentiate a mixed reality object from real. So onboarding the employees happens faster. Working with a company that hires 20,000 new people a year. Think of how much that saves. By the way, you guys are all snapping. I'm happy to send anybody these slides. Just email me, tweet to me, whatever. Um, training. The fundamentals of what training is, the knowledge never leaves the company. The learning of that employee that has been repairing those phone lines since the 1960s and is now leaving, that knowledge doesn't leave with that person. And by the way, they can make supplemental income in their retirement to be that see what I see voice sitting on the beaches of Miami. Okay, and career development. You have downtime, you can now learn other skill sets, be tested, and be ready. So people have an incentive to work harder and do stuff. Here's my favorite all-time example, because I'm an overgrown kid. When you flew out here today, on the tarmac, they load those big metal things under the bottom of a plane. They're filled with overnight packages. And it's a tough job, not the most motivating or exciting job. It wasn't people's career choice for their lives, I'm sure. But if you do it for a long time, you actually get 30% more in, which means most have 30% air, which means one out of three planes don't need to be flying, which means $2 billion a year savings for this particular client. So you put AR glasses on the person, it sees the shape, and your job now becomes 3D Tetris. You put it in the right place, you make more on your shift. If you're spatially challenged, you find a new job. So everybody wins in this environment, but including the person who lost their job, because why waste your life doing something that doesn't make you happy? Um, you want to set up something at home? Number one reason things are, are returned and, and, and problems, we don't know how to do it. It will see it, tell you what to connect, so when your teenagers leave home, you can still operate the equipment in your household. <laughs> and when they get their own place, you or a bot or a pre-existing video can show them how to repair various things in their home. And just by pointing your camera or your glasses at your broken sprinkler head, it will identify what it is, what tools you may want to get, tell you where it's in stock locally, would you like it delivered same day, you know, drone to you in the future, or it'll be waiting at will call at your home improvement store, and while you're there, it will give you a physical map where you'll see sprinkler heads to take you right to there. So you'll never get lost in the giant warehouse. It will be smart and help you. For security, it is amazing. Beyond facial recognition of knowing everybody, beyond knowing your temperature if you have a fever or communicable disease, there is a, a new uh, company uh, that we've been working with that monitors your gait and can tell, not that type of gait, how you walk, what your intent is. It, it knows you're up to no good. And when people are not moving the way that they normally should move. So tremendous positives. Uh, little Johnny gets lost by himself. I, at 18 months, 
old, was lost at Disneyland. I had a great time. I went on the Jungle Cruise again and again and again. I'm sure my parents were having a heart attack. I hope they were. Um, but now, security can just look at the little kid, identify that face from social media, from wherever, and solve those issues. Uh, and then the fun ones for production, you can now have the director actually see on the set where the dragon is, what's going on exactly, and not wait for these things to be animated later or composited later when the actors have long since gone. So every aspect changes very, very quickly when we have low cost ubiquity. Now, 5G, that's 100x of what we presently have. You're going to have more exponential things, and this is just the beginning of what can be done. So we have a couple minutes for questions, but I thank you for your, for your patience. Be brave and be kind. Any questions? Uh, what's the cost of creating these uh, environments and replicating them so that you can do training? So the question was, what's the cost of, of creating these environments? And the answer is the same as what's the cost of making a 30-second TV commercial. Okay? You can spend millions for when it's recorded. Or my favorite 30-second of all time was Tombow Death for Motel 6, and the screen's just black and says, this is what a $500 hotel room looks like when you're sleeping. This is what a $10 hotel room. So, We've done low-res polygon machines for the post office. They have giant machines that they can't shut down to train people so that you can see through the POV of the letter how it goes through the stuff so you can solve where to repair and what to do. Up to very complex simulations for medical that have to be so exact. We're working with uh, Stanford University uh, on uh, preoperative. Because seeing a 3D tumor and its position in a body on a 2D screen doesn't actually help anybody. Seeing it exactly why that person's laying there, exactly where it is in their body, where every millimeter makes a difference. Big, big, great question. Yes, in the way back, in the cheap seats. Uh, I've got the microphone. Ah, well, never mind. <laughs> oh, You'll sorry. You'll be you second. Ah, sure. So one question, um, I'm from real estate and you had this augmented reality about seeing through walls and all those things. The problem is, in my experience, is I would say about 90% of buildings and streets are not digitalized. So oh. you don't know where the tubes are, you don't know where everything is. How long will it take to get there? Because sensors can pick up surfaces, but I suppose you will have problems digging into the ground. So if you're talking about using that example in New York City or London or things that have been around forever, but in the new building and designing of buildings, the plans are all done in CAD, they're maintained, and we're going to have a new requirement coming up in, in our, our planning processes and our building codes to have those plans for safety, for security, and, 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 and for that. One of the great uses right now is in selling you know, high-rise apartments, you can now see the view at the 40th floor or the 50th floor before they even build, build the building. So there's both sides, but it's, it's not, no change is seamless, overnight, and easy. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. Yes? Um, so the, I thought that the airport picture was interesting because the augmented reality was revealing certain things about people walking along. And I'm wondering um, you know, if the technology accelerates to the point where you can learn things about people just walking around about their daily life that they would otherwise not want you to know about them, that if that's possible. So there's always a trade-off. Technology data in and of itself is neither good nor evil, okay? Every time we create something new, somebody can figure out another use for it. The people that caused all the problems down in, in Charlottesville, people were able to use facial recognition and out these people. So that was a good use. So there's going to be, and different societies in different countries will deal with privacy differently. But if you believe that there is privacy in the world that we live today, you're living in a different world. You're photographed all day long. You know, London, 50 photos in the first hour when you leave your home. So I, I agree with the, with, the, with the premise, but that's why when I give the example of that dystopian of everybody doing things, you're going to trust a certain brand or a certain company or whatever to augment and trade that information with you, and you'll give it for those uses just as you tell personal things to a doctor because you trust that relationship. A great talk, really inspiring. Thank uh, you. At the beginning, you mentioned everything's going to change in the next three years. Yes. How did you come up with that number, and what's going to happen in the next three years? So 
We're at the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, and no one would have predicted the rapid growth, how it changed our lives, how you can't go back, and it was just like Henry Ford with the car versus the horse. There's no going back. Disruption is not innovation. It's a fundamental shift and change. If you want my definition of, of disruption and why we know the timing, think back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. So back using my, my history things. When we ended the Stone Age, we learned how to make metals. We made little <laughs> knives. Then we made bigger swords. And then you get to that guy with the scimitar in the streets of Cairo. And then Indy pulls out the Smith & Wesson. Nobody's talking about swords anymore. So the idea of walking around with the phone and doing this and seeking and asking and da-da-da, when you can have that information fed to you as you need it, when your autonomous vehicle knows that you haven't had lunch, knows that you like the hamburger joint that's 1,600 feet ahead, they know that you like it, and they offer you free fries, and you say yes, and the car drives there. That's the world we're going to. Why three years? We learned from Pokemon Go that 750 million people were willing to do a not ideal experience, running around looking at a screen. It's now being used for many other things. In, in Tokyo, there's a great zoo that you can't find from the train station because the streets are like this. So you get off and you see little penguins walking in the street and you just follow the penguins. It's really fun. Um, how many of you forgot where you parked your car in the parking lot and would love to you know, follow you know, your favorite uh, animated character? So we know that the price of the hardware is down to the same price that people were spending for something that doesn't do it. If you trusted autonomous vehicles and then get over that fear factor, they're safer than humans, um, and you had, had a car that could drive itself and couldn't, and they're the same price, you're going to go. So we don't have the financial barrier. We don't have the infrastructure barrier for many of the killer apps because the places where we need those killer apps are wired. Okay, And you no longer have the gatekeepers to capital between you know, uh, ICOs with, with, with coin, uh, venture capital, crowdfunding. You're seeing so many of these things and the billions that are being spent right now to create these things, they will come out with a robust um, ecosystem. When the App Store opened, it opened with Monkey Ball. Okay? So you, know, you laugh, but you all learned how to swipe thanks to Angry Birds. So it takes very little to change human behavior and the speed of this will be at that exponential speed. Uh, last question. Uh, well, I haven't gone over here. You've got Hi, that. Jay. Uh, I know you, so this is going to be tough. Okay. Okay. So Singularity University's superpower is having people think about getting to a billion people within 10 years. Right. So can you think of a killer app that would combine VR or AR and artificial intelligence that could make a difference for a billion people within 10 years? So we know what computer dating did. The idea that anybody can communicate to anybody to me just seems you know you know it's babblefish it is it is the the end of the tower of babel it is such an amazing thing that i think we will take for granted the ability to communicate with anyone else on earth that to me is a billion people need that right away the fact that it also helps the hearing impaired and 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 other issues you know added benefit so anyway Welcome to the future, enjoy it, and thank you again for the time.